All right, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Dave from Scorhey Crossing. You're the audience and we are kicking off the Lunchbox Lesson Series here at Scorhey Crossing, a uh, series of presentations being offered to you during the day, during the week, so you can enjoy a lunch, listen in, tune in, and hear some pretty amazing history. So again, I'm Dave from Scorhey Crossing. Thank you very much for being here. I'm pretty excited about this one. Uh, I get a lot of questions about the St. Lawrence Seaway, and so I'm hopefully, hopefully going to learn some stuff here. Um, so we have with us today Ashley Moretti, who is the Executive Director of the St. Lawrence County Historical Association and has been a history museum professional for over a decade, holding a BA in History and Philosophy from Hood College and an MA in Applied History from Chippensburg University, formerly of the Erie Canal Museum uh, at the St. Lawrence Historical Association at least for a little while longer. Ashley, thank you very much. All right, well, thanks Thanks for inviting me. You know, I, 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 love, I love educating about history. It's been, been one of the best things that I've gotten to do as, as a museum professional. And it uh, looks like we have a, a small crowd today, small but mighty, but that's okay, we can do that. Um, all right, so as, as Dave said, I am Ashley Moretti and uh, welcome virtually to the St. Lawrence County Historical Association. Really glad you guys decided to join us today. Um, been here uh, several months and, you know, new new to the, the St. Lawrence region. And uh, prior to coming here, I was the curator of collections and exhibitions for the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse. And uh, while I was there, you know, I would write and deliver four talks a year at the museum and would give them kind of off-site, you know, for other museums, libraries, rotary clubs, etc. Um, so I really, I love public speaking of this nature and I really love creating engaging content for other people to enjoy and learn from. Uh, so this this uh, presentation has been my my first and only developed for here. Uh, so on this slide, as you can see, I've got our our info at slcha.org uh, uh, email address, which I know uh, Tracy Robertson is listening in on this, and she's probably cursing my name right now because that goes to her, and and she gets all kinds of requests in there. But if you have you know requests for information or you want to learn more about our our organization, maybe become a member, maybe donate, you know, that that would be the, the go to and also definitely look for us on Facebook. Um, our website is not great. Currently, we're hoping that that will change in the future. But for right now, the Facebook page is, is really nicely done. And we have all kinds of interesting content going on over there. So check that out. So of course, today, I'm going to be giving you a not super technical overview of the history and construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, honestly, this topic could comprise a whole series of talks. It is that deep and that broad. Um, if you were hoping for a super deep dive into the nitty gritty of the engineering and construction challenges of the Seaway, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it was my hope to keep this a very approachable talk for lay people. Uh, as a consolation prize, however, I do have some great historic photos and images of Seaway related artifacts that are in the collection here to show off. Um, I have a personal and professional interest in man-made waterways, and I had in fact hoped to present on this topic when I was at the Erie Canal Museum. So this seemed like a natural first topic for, for this series here. Uh, just one quick programming note, uh, in order to keep this rolling, I would appreciate it if you could type your questions into the chat box or otherwise hold them until the end. Um, I think everybody is muted on here except me. It feels like I'm, I'm in an empty room. I can hear the crickets. Um, I don't know that we have any Canadians in the audience. We definitely had Canadians in the audience when I've, I've given it for, for here. Um, but just FYI, I will be using imperial measurements throughout the talk. As much as I love the metric system personally, I'm giving this talk from a museum in the States. And my standard caveat, sorry if I don't cover your favorite piece of Seaway history or trivia, but if you have a cool fact about the Seaway, I'd love to hear it at the end. So now we can get started. So I thought it would be helpful to start this off with some information and a little history about the St. Lawrence River itself. The river is part of the international border between Canada and the United States, and it is and specifically the northern border of St. Lawrence County. It connects the five Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean, and it's the primary drainage of the Great Lakes Basin, the land which surrounds the Great Lakes. This area consists of the U.S. states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, along with the Canadian province of Ontario. The St. Lawrence River formed by way of the draining of the Champlain Sea, which was a temporary inlet of the Atlantic Ocean created by glaciers retreating at the end of the last glacial period. This was about 15,000 years ago. The river flows from, Saint, from Lake Ontario to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is the largest estuary in the world. An estuary is a partially enclosed coastal body of brackish water, mixture of fresh and salt water, with connections to both rivers and the ocean. Including the estuary, the length of the St. Lawrence is about 1,900 miles. So this is no tiny little stream here. 
The St. Lawrence was explored by Norse settlers in the 11th century and other European mariners, including John Cabot and Jacques Cartier in the 15th and 16th centuries. Cartier was the first European known to have sailed up the river and to have mapped and described it. He also gave it the name St. Lawrence in honor of the date of his arrival, which was the feast day of St. Lawrence. At the time of his arrival, the St. Lawrence Iroquois lived in the region surrounding the river and relations with European explorers were mixed at best, with indigenous people being kidnapped and brought back to Europe. The St. Lawrence River was a pivotal waterway in the history of this part of North America, and quite notably for whaling and during the 18th century conflicts between the French and the British. And the part of this conflict that took place in North America is known as the French and Indian War. As much as I hate to push the fast forward button on all of this history because it is really fascinating, I do want to get to the main thrust of my talk here today, which is, of course, the modern St. Lawrence Seaway. Here is a photograph from our collection, and this is uh, rushing waters of the river. This is pre-Seaway. So what is the St. Lawrence Seaway anyway? It is a 370 mile long system of man-made modifications to the existing waterways in this area. Namely, it's a series of canals, locks, and a few channels that enable ocean going vessels to travel from the Atlantic Ocean inland all the way to the Great Lakes and then vice versa. They allow ships to bypass rapids and dams along the way. As part of this effort to, to allow ocean going ships passage through the Great Lakes, the river is maintained at a navigation depth of 27 feet. The whole of the passage from the Atlantic Ocean to Duluth, Minnesota at the western end of Lake Superior comprises about 2,300 miles in total. So why was this project and goal such a big deal? Money was the major motivating factor, as I'm, I'm sure you all understand, um, along with making travel in the area easier. Until the 20th century, most of the maritime commerce in the Great Lakes region was purely regional. Uh, the Seaway sought to make this commerce more worldly and with good reason. The Great Lakes region of North America comprises the world's third largest economy after the United States as a whole and China. And I did not know that until I, I researched for this presentation. Today, cargo moving on the Great Lakes and the Seaway represents $46 billion in economic activity, $18 billion in wages, and 329,000 jobs. And this comes from a 2018 study called The Economic Impacts of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway System, and it was assembled by Martin Associates. I think they know what they're talking about. The Seaway itself runs from Montreal to Lake Erie and also includes the Welland Canal, which I will also talk about here shortly. As you can see, the area as a whole is huge. And it created a fourth coast, which is a phrase I've seen used several times up here in the North Country. Um, I admit, as a newcomer to the area, this confused me a little bit when I first arrived. I have no connection to either of these businesses, but they were just two of many that I found reference to using the phrase Fourth Coast. 500 engineers and 22,000 workers were involved in the Seaway's main construction push during the 1950s, which also included ancillary works like major bridges and tunnels in some of the cities along the Seaway. Over 1,000 construction contracts were granted by the governments of both countries involved, and some of them were even given to European firms, which increased the international reach of the project. Due, the due to the difficulty of the project, notably excavation in some areas of the river due to encounters with obstinate shale, sandstone, and marine clay, some of these contracts were defaulted on and new ones had to be written. Some contractors complained that they had been given incorrect soil specifications during the bidding process, and so they really had no idea what they were getting themselves into. The river was also a force to be reckoned with. The New York Times called the Seaway's construction, quote, a battle with the river. No job could be completed, no sides cut through, no dam poured without considering the temper temperament of the water's flow. And um, as I'm sure that at least a few of you in the audience know, since they, you guys live in upstate New York, the weather, particularly in winter, can be brutal. And workers were encouraged to pick up overtime since there was always a deadline to be met. So needless to say, work conditions were not exactly comfortable. The project required moving 210 million cubic yards of earth and rock, and it used over 6 million cubic yards of concrete. So here are a couple of images showing excavation of the river during the process. And then some images of uh, construction workers on the project as well. Um, this gentleman eating out of the, the can of Campbell's soup, I actually found a couple of photos with, with uh, Seaway workers eating out of soup cans. I think there was some kind of advertising campaign with Campbell's. Kind of interesting. And now we have a brief interlude about concrete. Concrete is an ancient building material that was incredibly important to the construction of the modern world, including the seaway. So this is a good place to give you a little information about what exactly it is in case you've never pondered it before, and I'm guessing that maybe you haven't. Concrete is a composite material made of fine and coarse aggregate, sand, gravel, crushed stone, etc., mixed with a fluid cement that then hardens. 
Cements are usually lime or calcium silicate based, and there are two different kinds. Hydraulic cement hardens due to a chemical reaction with water, and non-hydraulic cement hardens because of carbon dioxide in the air. Concrete starts out as a slurry made when the cement and the aggregate material are mixed with water. It can then be poured and molded and used for construction. Concrete dates back to ancient times, with Mayans, Egyptians, and Romans all using it in their buildings. After the fall of Rome, the technology to create it was lost, only for it to be redeveloped in the 18th century, right before man-made waterways became all the rage in Europe and then in North America. The concrete to be used on the Seaway project was developed based on the needs of each component of construction, and it was lab tested and then retested over time just to make sure that it would hold up. The St. Lawrence Seaway represents a notable cooperation between the United States and Canada, and the history between these two nations had previously been poor enough to spur the creation of a canal from the Hudson River across New York State to Lake Erie, bypassing Lake Ontario. This is, of course, the famous Erie Canal, and when plans were being made for its creation in the early 19th century, there was concern that if the canal had been dug to Lake Ontario directly, it would have benefited Canada more so than the United States. After the Erie Canal opened in 1825, the Oswego Canal was constructed from Syracuse to Lake Ontario and opened in 1828, but it had to have smarted that New Yorkers made more work for themselves by digging the first New York Canal across the state to avoid enriching Canada, which was a British colony at the time. The logo pictured here is the logo of the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation. As you can see, it includes elements of both star and maple leaf. So obviously the Great Lakes region is no stranger to canals. I'm trying to avoid going farther into the history of the Erie Canal here, you know, because I'm passionate about it. Um, if you're truly curious, you know, set up a time with me and I'll fill you in or, you know, Dave, like we're, you know, we're, we're canal people. Um, but before we get into the 20th century struggles of the Seaway, I do want to talk about the history of another early 19th century canal, the Welland, as it is part of the modern St. Lawrence Seaway. It's also a major shipping connection between the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River and it helps to bridge elevation as well as distance. The Welland Canal connects lakes, on, er, on, uh, excuse me, lakes Ontario and Erie, allowing ships to bypass the formidable Niagara Falls, which is 167 feet high via canal. It uses locks, which are like elevators for boats, to get over the Niagara Escarpment. An escarpment, or a cuesta, is a steep slope or long cliff that separates two areas of differing elevations. The southern terminus of the canal at Lake Erie is 326 feet higher than the northern terminus at Lake Ontario, so that is a lot of height to get over. There's a little canal lock 101 for you, and I will be going into a little bit more detail on some of the St. Lawrence Seaway locks a little bit later on. So the Welland Canal has been through four different incarnations, beginning with the first Welland Canal, constructed between 1824 and 1829. This canal was petitioned for by nine businessmen in the Niagara District, including William Hamilton Merritt whose water-powered industries, including a sawmill and a gristmill, along the 12 Mile Creek on the Niagara Peninsula, needed a more reliable source of water. Using a canal to divert water from the Welland River seemed like just the ticket. With some discussion, the petitioners had the idea to make this waterway navigable, rather than just a way to bring water to the area. And as a result of Merritt's involvement, the first and second Welland canals were routed by way of the creek, and later versions bypassed most of it. The first ran from Port Dalhousie, Ontario, and ran along the creek to Port Robinson, where con connected to the Welland River. The Welland River connects to, Niagara, to the Niagara River below the falls and then exits to Lake Erie. By 1833, more locks had been added, the feeder canal had been expanded, and the canal itself was extended from Port Robertson to Port Colburn. Uh, with this addition, the canal was 27 miles long and had 40 wooden locks. The locks were sized at a minimum of 110 feet long by 22 feet wide, and the canal was dug to a depth of 7.9 feet. This project was labor intensive and completed and operated with man and animal power as all early 19th century canals. And it quickly became evident that it wasn't wide enough to accommodate the increasing size of ships. Plus those wooden locks deteriorated very quickly. So moving on to the second Welland Canal, this was constructed 1839 to 1848. This one used cut limestone locks. And while the route remained much the same, the canal and its locks were widened and deepened to nine feet, allowing for larger ships to pass through and the number of locks went from 40 to 27. The third Welland Canal departed from the route of 12 Mile Creek and made it shorter and more direct, running from Port Dalhousie to Allenburg and bypassing a lot of the canal community centers along the previous route. It was also widened and deepened to 14 feet and a lock was removed, making the new total 26. It also quickly became too small. Are you sensing a pattern here? <laughs> The fourth and current Welland Canal was constructed between 1913 and 1932 with a break during the years of World War I due to manpower shortages. 
Several thousand people were involved over the duration of the project, with 4,000 working on it at its peak. The route changed again, and it now runs perpendicular to the Niagara Escarpment, making it the most direct route of all previous versions of the canal. It has eight locks, seven of which are lift locks. They raise or lower ships by 43 to 49 feet apiece for a total of 326 feet of elevation change between the two Great Lakes. The eighth and southernmost at Port Colborne is a guard lock, which controls the variance in water level. It takes ships an average of 11 hours to travel the length of the current Welland Canal. So now we know about the Welland Canal, which is a key part of the St. Lawrence Seaway, so we can learn about the rest of the system. So we're going to start with a, a little bit of political history here, a uh, history of the Unified Project's initial undertaking, which was a long time coming. In the 1890s, initial proposals for a deep water connection between the Great Lakes and the ocean were first floated. Get it? Along with the improvements to the usability of the waterways, a hydroelectric power component was suggested as well. Such a project would ideally involve the cooperation between the two countries separated by the river and the Great Lakes. So the idea was batted back and forth between the U.S. and Canada, and in 1895, the first joint U.S.-Canadian Deep Waterways Commission was formed to study the feasibility of such a project. In 1909, there was an international joint commission, but no, project, no progress was made. When the fourth Welland Canal was completed in 1932, the idea had another resurgence, and the Great Lakes-St. Lawrence Deep Waterway Treaty was signed July 18, 1932. President Herbert Hoover made a statement asserting that the completion of the project, quote, will have a profoundly favorable effect upon the development of agriculture and industry throughout the Midwest. A large byproduct of power will benefit the Northeast. These benefits are mutual with the Great Dominion to the North, meaning Canada. Although the treaty was submitted to the U.S. Senate and hearings were held, the vote taken in March 1934 didn't get the two-thirds majority required to be ratified. The proposal was batted back and forth for several more years, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King agreed in 1941 to partner on the Joint Waterway and Hydroelectric Power Initiative, but found resistance from interests representing Atlantic and Gulf Coast shipping along with the railroads, which, if you think about it, makes a lot of sense. They all stood to lose money if the St. Lawrence was going to be optimized for shipping. Roosevelt was a major supporter of the project because of its potential use for national defense. As he said in June 1941, I know of no single project of this nature more important to this country's future in peace and war. President Harry Truman was also a strong supporter of the Seaway Project. But after 1945 and amid continued delays, the Canadians grew impatient and began to explore ways to complete the project without U.S. cooperation. In 1951, then-Canadian Prime Minister Louis St. Laurent told Tr President Truman that they would do just that. The International Joint Commission then issued an order for, of approval for joint construction of the Moses Saunders, Saunders Power Dam in October of 1952. This was the domino that finally knocked over the whole line, and after legislative approval, former, formal steps towards the creation of the Seaway began on May 13, 1954, when President Eisenhower signed the Wiley, Wiley Dondero Seaway Act to allow joint construction and to establish the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation as the overseer for the American work. The work formally began in August 1954 with a groundbreaking ceremony on, on the site of what was to become the Moses Saunders Power Dam. Ultimately, the St. Lawrence Seaway would cost Canada $330 million and the U.S. $130 million, and then Canada put in an additional $300 million to improve the existing Welland Canal. Tolls are charged to pay for the seaway, and of course, the electricity generated by the power dam is also sold. Now we can move on to talk about some more individual parts of the project. Um, we discussed the Welland Canal already, so we can move on to the Moses Saunders Power Dam. The dam is named for Robert Moses and Robert H. Saunders. Moses was the chairman of NIPA, the New York Power Authority at the time, and oversaw the American side of the project. Robert H. Saunders was the, chair, was the chairman of Ontario Hydro, a now former Canadian power company, and he oversaw the Canadian side of the project. Saunders died in 1955 after a plane crash and did not live to see his name affixed to the dam. The project included the main dam along with the Long Sioux Dam, the Eisenhower and Snell Locks, the Messina Intake, which provides water for local consumption, and almost 11 miles worth of dikes to regulate water levels. The dam itself is 195 and a half feet tall and 3,212 feet long, and it is located in between the Canadian city of Cornwall and Barnhart Island, which is just a little northeast of Messina, New York, here in St. Lawrence County. The nearby Long Sioux Dam, which is a little bit smaller, was created in order to serve as a spillway to cope with floodwaters on the river. Moses Saunders Dam has 32 turbine generators, which are split evenly between Canadian and American operation. It supplies power to two hydroelectric power stations. On the American side is the St. Lawrence Franklin D. Roosevelt Power Project, and on the Canadian side is the R.H. Saunders Generating Station. 
So here's a photo I took of the Moses Saunders Power Dam back in October. This was right before I moved up here. You know, you got to go sightseeing when you're in a new place. And then here are some aerial shots of the Long Sioux Dam. That's uh, 1958 on the left, and the right side is a contemporary photo. Lake St. Lawrence was created as part of construction. It serves as a four-way for the dam and is basically an area where the river was deepened and widened. The creation of the lake was finalized on July 1st, 1958, when a coffer dam, which is an enclosure in a body of water to allow for maintenance or repairs to be made in a dry area, was demolished using explosives, allowing the water to flow back to the dam. It took four days for it to become operational. So projects such as this one, unfortunately, often comes with some loss. And in the case of the dam, the creation of the lake resulted in the lost villages of the St. Lawrence region. There were 10 communities uh, in the Cornwall area, and they were all submerged in the process of creating the functioning dam. So now they are underwater ghost towns. The residents of the area were relocated to the new planned communities of Long Sioux and Ingleside. This was really controversial uh, because the home and business owners felt that they were undercompensated for their property as the wait for the Seaway project to commence had depressed property values in the area. There were two other communities, Morrisburg and Iroquois, that were partially flooded by the project, but homes and business buildings were moved intact rather than being left behind. 6,500 people were displaced in all and 530 buildings were moved, with many other homes and businesses demolished. There was also some water inundation on the New York side of the river, but no communities were as affected as those in Ontario. The Mohawks of Aquasasne were also severely impacted by the construction of the dam. 1,200 acres of reserve land and 15,000 acres of traditional lands were flooded, and no compensation was offered at the time. They also weren't consulted about the project at all. In 2008, after a 15-year-long effort to address past wrongs, Ontario Power Generation and the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne came to agree on a proposed settlement involving a monetary compensation, a transfer of lands back to the Aquasasne, and an agreement for environmental stewardship. So now we can talk about four additional small canals on the St. Lawrence Seaway and their seven locks. I'm a big fan of locks, as you can probably tell. I'm the person who drives around New York State in rubbernecks whenever she passes remnants of former canal locks. I am a hopeless nerd, but I'm comfortable with who I am. I discussed the eight locks to be found on the Welland Canal, so now we can look at the remaining seven. The South Shore Canal spans 14 nautical miles and includes two locks. The St. Lambert Lock raises or lowers ships by 15 feet, and the Coote St. Catherine Lock raises or lowers ships by 30 feet. These two connect the Port of Montreal to Lake St. Louis. The canal bypasses the Lachine Rapids near Montreal. Here's an image from our collection showing uh, lock construction. I'm not actually sure which lock they're, they're working on here. Uh, the Beauharnois Canal is home to two locks that were added during the Seaway project. This joins Lake St. Louis to Lake St. Francis, which is 11.3 nautical miles long. The upper and lower locks raise or lower ships 41 feet each. Here's an image of the upper lock drained of water. And the Wiley Dondro Canal has the two locks out of 15 that are managed by the United States. The Snell, 45 feet, and the Eisenhower Locks, 83 feet. Excuse me, 38 feet. It's eight nautical miles long and provides access to Lake St. Lawrence. It was formerly called the Long Sioux Canal, but it was renamed in order of, in honor of Senator Alexander Wiley and Congressman George Dondro, who were both Seaway advocates. So I love this photo. This is the best photo in the whole presentation as far as I'm concerned. Apparently, the Seaway Queen and her court were present at the opening of the Snell Lock in July of 1958. <laughs> and here is a photo of the engineering control room of the Snell Lock. And uh, as you can see, Dwight and maybe Eisenhower there that, among the crowd. Uh, this was the formal, formal opening of the Eisenhower Lock and the Eisenhower Lock under construction. So the Iroquois Canal is the shortest. It's only uh, 0.3 nautical miles, and it has one lock and a water control facility. The razor lower level at this lock is only a foot. And here is the buoy boat Grenville passing through the Iroquois Lock. So we can talk about the ships a little bit. The ships that travel through these locks can be up to 740 feet long, 78 feet wide, and 26 and a half feet deep. Many ships used in the Seaway were purposely built to this size, which is known as Seaway Max. 
and the locks themselves are 766 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 30 feet deep. It takes 7 to 10 minutes for a lock to fill with 24 million gallons of water and about 45 minutes for a ship to get through one of them. Visiting ocean-going vessels in the seaway are known as salties, and a lot of these are too big to get through the seaway beyond Montreal. However, if they are small enough to get through the seaway's relatively small locks, then they can go anywhere in the Great Lakes themselves, where the Polock, which enables travel between Lake Superior and the lower Great Lakes at Sault Ste. Marie, are larger. Salties have sharp sides and a V-shaped hull, along with cranes on their decks to help with cargo loading and unloading. Conversely, the ships that ply the Great Lakes are known as lakers, and because of the smaller size of the seaway locks, many of these are confined to the upper, larger Great Lakes. They have vertical sides and a snub-nosed bow. The third type of sh large ship common to the seaway are called tug-propelled barges, and these are tugboats that have been fitted into a special kind of barge. The majority of cargo moved on the seaway by these vessels consist of iron ore, coal, or other products of mining, along with agricultural, agricultural goods, bulk, bulk cargo like oil or cement, and finished goods like iron and steel. The last several years, there's been a lot more discussion about increasing container shipping on the seaway. Container shipping has become common around the world, but has never had that same big foothold in the seaway. The first through transit of the completed seaway was April 25th, 1959, when the icebreaker Durberville passed through the, sea, passed through the seaway. Then the St. Lawrence Seaway had its official ceremonial opening on June 26, 1959. The opening ceremony was attended by Canadian Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower, and England's Queen Elizabeth II. They took a short cruise on the royal yacht HMY Britannia. And here are some photos of Eisenhower with Queen Elizabeth, of course. So now we can talk a little bit about some of the effects that the St. Lawrence Seaway has had on the region. Uh, economic effects first. The seaway is important for international trade and handles 40 to 50 million tons of cargo every year. Half of it travels between international ports in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and the other half is coastal trade between American and Canadian ports. Composition of shipping has changed since the seaway opened. Europe no longer imports large amounts of grain from North America, and instead it is sent to South America, Asia, and Africa. So geographically, the seaway really isn't all that great for this shipping. And instead, Gulf Coast and West Coast ports have become a lot more important. Overall shipping on the seaway has declined 48% since 1980, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Seaway Corporation. This is due in part to the decline in domestic manufacturing, along with concerns over deteriorating infrastructure to support shipping. And the seaway closes for shipping during winter months, while other means of transport continue right on through winter. Nonetheless, the seaway moves on. Uh, in 2003, the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes were rebranded and are now known as Highway H2O, which is pretty apt, I think. The St. Lawrence Seaway is also credited with helping to make the 20th century Erie Canal obsolete as a means of business shipping. While the Seaway did deal a serious blow to the Erie Canal and other New York canals, it has gone on to a second life as a major draw for recreational activities. Plus, you know, the Erie Canal is still used to ship items that are too large or heavy to go by railway or highway. There have also, of course, been environmental impacts, including the loss of spawning grounds for local fish populations, pollution, and resulting water quality issues. There have also been concerns about water level management and maintaining natural variability in the water levels to support biodiversity. In the last several years, both New York and Ontario have created programs to support improvements to the environment in the St. Lawrence region. Invasive species have become a problem, and conservationists say that since the opening of the seaway, over 180 non-native species have been introduced to the region by way of ocean-going vessels. These include Asian carp, lamprey eels, and zebra mussels, which I have pictured here. All of these compete with, with the uh, native species for resources and damage commercial and sport fishing, recreation, and tourism. It is far too often that with technological progress comes environmental degradation and often harm to already marginalized communities. Uh, recreational effects. International cruise lines and thousands of recreational boats pass through the seaway every year. Well, maybe not 2020 and maybe not 2021 so far because nothing has really been all that normal lately. The seaway has become a recreational showpiece in this area. You can fish, you can scuba dive, or if you're me, you can gawk at the locks, dams, bridges, and evidence of what humans can accomplish with enough time, money, labor, and concrete. And on that note, Thank you so much. Uh, if you enjoyed this and would like to check out what else our organization has to offer or, or support us, uh, you can 
uh, check out the links that Dave was nice enough to put into the, the chat box there. Um, this is this is a great organization. You know, we've got a membership of, of over 800 um, people and institutions. Um, we put out a quarterly newsletter as well as a history journal. Uh, and in this image, by the way, that is a matchbook that is in our collection celebrating the St. Lawrence Seaway. All right. So I figured I'd scan through the chat box here and see if uh... <laughs> Dave, were you bored? <laughs> no, no I, I wanted to add a little bit of a color humor to the uh, the side here with, with a couple of the comments, not to, to interrupt while you're talking. And if anybody has questions, use that, that function or or otherwise indicate to me that you have questions, we can pose that to Ashley about St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, yeah, I know. Other great things of St. Lawrence County. Um, I, I did. I, I put in a couple of things. I'm glad you kind of touched on. And one of the reasons I get questions here about it is uh, typically in the the phrasing or, or some form of a question or or even sometimes a direct comment that the St. Lawrence Seaway was responsible for uh, the great reduction of Erie Canal commerce. And, and I, I normally tend to resort to not name calling, but but saying that the Erie Canal. <laughs> Uh, it, in my opinion, it sort of it it worked itself out of its job. Uh, by it being kind of it kind stuff. of did. Yeah, it did. And and honestly, I would I would put more of the blame, quite frankly, on railroads and also on the throughway. Yeah, the, more the so than the Saint Lawrence Seaway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's something like that. And it's also a good example to fourth graders when they come for school trips. Uh, you you never want to uh, you know if you're building robots, that becomes your your job. I yeah. can build a robot that will replace what you do. Exactly. And so uh, that's that's a, a life lesson that I impart, you know, whatever wisdom I may have, the future generations. Oh, God, you're, about, you're educating the future generations. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is that about disrupting uh, from within? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the other things I noticed, I'm kind of curious myself, um, you showed one of the control rooms for a lock, and, and it looks like a... It almost looks like NASA. It is a. It, like it did. Complex. It really. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of like when you'd see footage from the Apollo missions of the mission control. And, and I think that I, you know, in my brain, I'm uh, comparing that to the uh, the structures and the, the lock operation on today's modern barge canal in New York, in which mm -hmm. there's still just essentially a couple of levers to be able to operate yeah. the gates. Um, this looks extremely complicated. Yes, it does. <laughs> But you got to you got to remember. I'm not sure how much how much power is is represent operating power is represented here. I mean, you remember they they went to the moon with with no more computing power than than a, a contemporary calculator has. Right. Yeah. And we. Have, I mean, this uh, was the 1950s. So. And today we carry you know the world's great knowledge and technology within our pockets in a cell phone, and we exactly. can kind of or, just look or, at you know, or you know, or you know, a smartwatch. I mean. <laughs> yes, yeah, like crazy. This is great. Um, and, and I don't know if you could kind of what was the reasoning behind and I and I am blanking on the name of the lock, but it's a one foot lift. Um, oh, your quad lift. lock? That that seems sort of like a uh, It does. Yeah, it it I, does. I'm I'm not sure is, if maybe yeah. the maybe the geography didn't didn't require any any more of a lift right there. I'm not sure what the what the purpose of that was, but it almost seems like there could have been a way to to otherwise uh, adjust the navigation depths on both sides by six inches and maybe uh, not, yeah. not have a lift. It's a it's a weird thing. I I, I don't want to I don't want to. I'm not an expert at all, but I would conjecture that it seems like there's a contract that was issued to a company uh, as a favor for construction. But that that, that is just me conjecturing. That might well be the case, you know, and maybe they just, I don't, I don't know. You, you see both, you see it both ways, you know, how on the barge canal, like some locks are missing, like there's no lock four on the Oswego canal, mm -hmm. you know, that they, they did their calculations, they did their drawings and then it turned out they didn't actually need it. Right. And, and on the throughway, there's, there's um, exits that don't exist. Yeah. So that's what's fun. And, and you mentioned container shipping, and I just I just heard something on NPR. I think uh, in the last couple of days, uh, which they're talking about container ships losing cargo, and something like an average that at least one container winds up being lost every day uh, yeah. in the parts of the ocean. So uh, I imagine that would probably cause all sorts of problems in the Great Lakes or, or on the the, the seaway, uh, as evidence maybe yeah. the recent Panama Canal that if there was a oh gosh yes yes or, or, 
Yeah, the, Su the Suez. Yeah, that was a, that was a mess. You know, if you're if you're really interested in container shipping, there's a uh, there's a great a great chapter in one of my favorite books. It's called Grounded: A Down to Earth Journey Around the World. And uh, basically, uh, this guy Seth Stevenson, who's a, the favorite favorite freelance writer of mine, he's written for Slate, he's written for a bunch of things, and uh, he decided that he was going to circumnavigate the Earth, and you know, went with his girlfriend, but they weren't going to set foot on an airplane. So this was to be a down to earth circumnavigation, and they made passage across the Atlantic Ocean from Philadelphia to Antwerp, Belgium, on a container ship. And there's very interesting history of contain of container shipping in there, and kind of how they work. And yeah, it's cool. So I, I recommend checking that out. Nice. Yeah, be quick, uh, quick the experience. I don't know if that's something you can find in your, your local travel guide or, or vacation. Uh, <laughs> they had to make special arrangements to be able to travel on one of those. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so this is kind of a last call for anybody that is is tuning into this program to pop a question up in the, the chat. Uh, I think you've covered some great information, some stuff I hadn't heard about or hadn't come across that I would really use. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that. Of course. I'm typing away. So. All right. All right. Well, I guess I, I, I guess we can end it here. Thank you. Thank you guys for for listening. I hope hope you learned something. <laughs> thank you very much for your time, everybody who joined in. Thank you, Ashley, for this wonderful presentation, agreeing to uh, provide a program for us. And the time, your energy, your resources, uh, it, it is not unnoticed. And All right. Thank you very much. And hopefully, uh, plenty more people will check this out on YouTube later on. I'll post it up and send you the link. Yes, so, please, please send me the link. That would be great. That's great. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye.